you turn with me to uh, the book of Genesis and to Genesis chapter 17. <clears throat> we'll read the whole chapter, uh, verses, uh, verse 1 uh, to the end of verse 27. But if you would pay particular attention, please, to verses 9 to 14. That's the main focus of our, um, uh, our text for uh, this morning. So Genesis chapter 17, reading from verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. And when Abraham, Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be shall her name be and i will bless her and give thee a son also of her yea i will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations kings of people shall be of her then abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old and shall sarah that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant 
will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham, and Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins in the same day, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger were circumcised with it. Thus far we read in God's holy and infallible word. So as intimated our um, subject this morning is the sign of the covenant, the covenant of grace that is established with Abraham here. Uh, and then this afternoon we'll look at the sign of the covenant in the New Testament uh, of the Scriptures. There is a sign both in the Old and in the New, which I'm sure you're very, very aware of. Um, they are symbols, they are signs. Signs, symbols are not the reality. They are signs, and what do signs do? Signs, they point to something. The question is, what do the signs point to? The symbols are different in the old dispensation and in the new dispensation. But the symbols are, I suggest to you, and will show to you uh, before the days through, I will show to you that the symbols are identical in meaning. One is physical and national in the old dispensation. The other is spiritual and international in the new covenant. So here uh, in Genesis chapter 17, we have the introduction of circumcision, the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament dispensation. If there were any sanitary or health care reasons for the application of circumcision back then in those days, uh, I don't know, but that would be merely and simply only incidental. This is God's purpose, this is God's commandment to Abraham, who is already a converted man, to put it in New Testament terms, He's a, he knows God, he walks with God, and God now he commands him to um, apply this symbol to every male in his household, himself included. It's God's purpose, it's a commandment that he applies this right sacrament, as we call it, as we term it in reformed uh, terminology. It is strictly, it is a sign, it is a symbol of God's covenant, his covenant of grace. There is only one covenant from beginning to end throughout the entirety of God's revelation. One covenant, it's a covenant of grace, God's undeserved favor to those whom he will serve. Uh, save and uh, bring to a knowledge of himself. And uh, so the sign is primarily, it, it's a sign um, given to apply to the individual male within the congregation then. And of course, um, well, it has application to, to the parents uh, and even to the wife of the children to whom the uh, sacrament is applied. It is a, a sign, uh, it is symbolic that the child of the parents who are applying the sacrament to their child, that their child is, it's a remembrance to them, a stark remembrance to them if you like, that their child is a member of the covenant community. 
Their child is not a heathen. Their child is not an outsider. The child belongs to the church, belongs to the covenant community of God's people, is a child of God. And this is confirmation to the parents of the child who is to be circumcised. And then, too, of course, it's, um, it's a mark, it's a sign, a symbol, if you like, of their faithfulness in their obedience to God in having the sign applied to their child or children. It, is, uh, it signifies their commitment to God's will uh, in applying the sign, the sacrament to the child, and a commitment also not just simply to have the child done, as it would be put in the apostate churches, but simply um, a commitment to apply the sacrament and to train the child in the way of the covenant, to train the child in the things of the Lord, raising the child up as a child of God, not an outsider who eventually needs to be converted, but is a covenant child and is to be brought up in such a way in the admonition and nurture of the Lord because the child is in the Lord. Your children will be my children, says God to Abraham. And it's a confirmation of their trust in God to bless the fruit of their marital union because that is what God is promising here promising to Abraham and to promise and promising to his people throughout the generations to the end of the age so when you have your when you have the sign of the covenant applied to your children you are trusting God to bless the fruit of your marital union it's a token it's a sign to the male himself who has had the sign applied to him, it is a daily testimony to him, a, re a reminder to him, I don't belong to that world out there, I belong to God, I'm a child of God, and I have a responsibility, I am accountable to God. It's a reminder, it's a symbol of his consecration to God. Reminding, reminding these young males that they belong to the elect of God. They are part of, of a company of people, a holy nation that belongs to God. Well, as Peter terms it in the, in the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter says, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, thy children, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. So the covenant sign here, verses 9 through 14, circumcision in the Old Testament dispensation. Notice the emphasis in verse 16, and I will bless her, this is Sarai, Sarah, and give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Abraham and Sarah had to be brought to grasp, to understand that it was God alone who could bring this thing about. They were going to have a child in their old age. But they have to... They have to understand 
that it's God and God alone who can bring this about. The realization not just of the bringing forth of this child, but the realization of God's covenant of grace and all its implications in their lives, fulfilling everything that he has promised, not just to them, but to his seed, to their seed, and their seed after them. It won't be accomplished by them. It won't be accomplished by, um, a, you know, by Abraham um, himself, you know, manipulating things. Um, well, you know, um, Ishmael, for, 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 for example, uh, gotten of the handmaid. They have to come to the realization that only God himself can bring this about. So they're brought to a place of absolute and utter hopelessness. Verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born uh, unto him that is a hundred years old and shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? Um, staggering that, that there's not a hope any way possible that these two people could bear a child. Only God Almighty could bring this to pass. So the significance of the obligation, they are to keep covenant with God, verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant there for thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. The covenant has, um, brings accountability, imposes upon Abraham and upon his household, upon his children, his seed as well, in walking with God. If you go back to verse 1, when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. He is to walk completely, that is, in the way of the covenant, in obedience to God. This is what the covenant, God's grace coming to him, this imposes this upon him. And here, now there comes a new feature. A sign is added, a covenant sign that is to be applied here in the Old Testament dispensation is to be applied to all the males in his household. So what is the significance of this obligation? What is the significance of the sign? Now remember, it's a symbol, it's a sign, that's all it is. And the sign, as I said, it points to something. What does it symbolize? That the evil, the evil has to be cut away. Purification is what it points to. The surgeon's knife, not just forgiveness, that God forgives us in the covenant of grace is wonderful, exquisite, to know that your sins have been forgiven, blotted out, that you are justified unto all eternity, wonderful. But the sin nature has to be dealt with. That has to be cut away. That has to be circumcised, in other words. Now the reality, the sign, the symbol, Abraham can apply to his children, but only God can do the latter. They have to be, putting it in New Testament terminology, they have to be born again. It points to the need of the puri purification of life at its very source the male reproductive organ. It points to the obligations imposed upon the covenant communica community. The obligations of putting away the sin life, the circumcising of the heart. A person can have the right 
can have the sign applied to them. And there are many we see in the Old Testament who were like this. They were circumcised, but they were ungodly. They were apostate. They were wretched. So their circumcision counted for nothing. Likewise, in the New Testament, you have many, many people who would claim to have been baptized, but they live ungodly apostate. They've never been circumcised in heart. They've never been born again. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Many in Jesus' day who claimed that was their claim, we are Jews, we've been circumcised. So what? Unless you have been circumcised in heart, it means nothing. But the sign is a constant reminder it's a reminder to the child who has been circumcised. It was a reminder to them of the messianic hope, the Messiah to come, the one who would come and who would purify, bring about the realization of the purifying of their lives. In him, in Messiah, in Jesus Christ, is what the right signifies, points to. It reminds them of their obligations and it even foreshadows the sign in the new covenant baptism the signs of ministration verses 11 through 13 and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, bought the money of a stranger, uh, which is not of thy seed. The whole household had to be circumcised. And of course, it's a seal. It seals the covenant of grace for those to whom it is applied. The believer and their children are marked as being, as belonging to God. They're given an identity, you know, God's covenant children. And of course, this applies in the New Testament as well. It establishes the antithesis, the distinction that God has made in the human race between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. God has made this distinction, this separation. And God's people, God's covenant people, are called to maintain that antithesis, that separation. You don't belong to the world. You don't behave like the world. You don't walk with the world. You don't get involved with the world. You belong to God's covenant people. And that brings accountability in position to both the parents, the believer, believers, and their children. They're given a new identity, identifying themselves with the covenant people of God. And so these children are to be raised in the knowledge of the Lord, as belonging to the Lord. They're to be raised in the atmosphere of the covenant, amongst the covenant people of God. That is, in the church, Lord's Day by Lord's Day. Being taught, being catechized, learning the scriptures from childhood, and growing up in faith, trusting the Lord right from day one. This is the heart. It's a covenant of grace. And these are gracious promises that God declares to his people and to their children as well. The undeserved favor of God to us and to our children. I will bless you and your children. But the sign too, of course, is also a picture. It's a reminder to us 
of the misery, the pain, and the shame of sin that the grace of God has rescued us from. And that redemption, redemption is by blood having been shed. It points forward to Messiah and the shedding of his blood because circumcision was a bloody business. So it's looking forward to, it's a sign, looking forward to the putting off of the sinful flesh in Christ. And so therefore is a dedicatory act, an expression of the believer's gratitude for the covenant of grace in having the sacrament applied to them, to their children, it is, it is an expression of gratitude, of thankfulness, deep gratitude to God for his grace, his undeserved favor for rescuing us from the misery and the pain and the shame and the disgrace of our sin. But note to all you that the sign rejectors are excluded, verse 14. And the uncircumcised man, child, his flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised. That soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Well, this is the argument, of course, that the um, that some people um, would uh, would bring to bear uh, against the sacrament of baptism being applied to children. They say, well, look at many of the children who are baptized in infancy, uh, but they walk away, um, they become apostate and have nothing to do with the Lord. Well, children, we know, we understand, um, when uh, baptized in infancy or not, uh, willfully walk away, walk out of the family, walk away from their covenant obligations to the Lord, You've got an example in Esau. Uh, Esau in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Oh, there are many, many Esau's. Many Esau's. Children who willfully, deliberately walk away from the covenant family and from the covenant of grace. They make it manifest that they make a deliberate decision to walk against the covenant and its obligations. But that, beloved, does not mean to say that they should not receive the sign of the covenant, whether in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It doesn't mean that Esau ought not to have been circumcised. He was circumcised. It was simply a matter of obedience um, concerning his parents. It was what God commanded of them. But if the covenant children are to receive, if it's commanded of the parents, that they are to receive the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament, then I ask you, why not in the New Testament? Where is it, where do you see it in the Bible that the sign changes, the application of the sign changes in the New Testament? I submit to you, I submit to you that it doesn't. On the contrary, it is established. The covenant is everlasting and so, so therefore the sign the application of the sign the sacrament is everlasting too so where I ask you 
Where in all the Bible does it say that God changed his mind? God says to Abraham here quite clearly, I will bless you and your seed, yeah? Throughout the generations, he says, yeah? So where in the Bible, tell me please, where does it say that God changed his mind concerning that matter? Well, let me show you differently. Acts chapter 2, verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Heidelberg Catechism, question 74. Are infants also to be baptized? Answer, yes. For since they, as well as the adult, are included in the covenant and church of God, and since redemption from sin by the blood of Christ and the Holy Ghost, the author of faith, is promised to them no less than to the adult, they must therefore by baptism as a sign of the covenant be also admitted into the Christian church and be distinguished from the children of unbelievers as was done in the old covenant or testament by circumcision instead of which baptism is instituted in the new covenant. It stands just the same to the end of the age. But neither in the Old Testament or in the New Testament does the sign work salvation. It doesn't save the children. It's a sign, it's a symbol. That's all that it is pointing, pointing to the reality. So the sign, the symbol, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament does not work salvation. The child can be raised in the knowledge of the Lord. It can be catechized and it can be taught. It can be nurtured amongst the people, the covenant people of God. It can enjoy for years many and all of the covenant privileges afforded a child. And still walk away. Yet many are raised Many are raised in Reformed Evangelical churches today, raised in total ignorance of God and of Christ. This is a subject, I tell you, that we have not even begun, begun to address in our churches. Our dealings with our children, covenant children, this is our first line of evangelism before you hit the street, before you get out amongst the heathen out there with the gospel, there is somebody in this room more important to God than all them, that child. That's your first line of evangelism. Yeah? Secondly, the covenant son verses 15 through 22, Sarai is given the promise here of motherhood. Her name is changed from Sarai to Sarah. She moves from being the quarrelsome wife to being a princess. That's what the word Sarah means, verse 15. And she will be a princess, the princess, of all female believers. They, they are her daughter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, small l, calling him Lord, whose daughter ye are, as long as you do well, are not, are not afraid with any amazement. That's some subjection, is it not? Yeah? my Lord Abraham. They are promised parenthood, verses 16 and following, and after them through the generations, their seed and their seed after them, there will come kings 
and they will become nations. Look at Abraham's reaction, verse 17. He fell on his face and he laughed. But it's the laughter of faith. It's not the laughter of unbelief. It's not the laughter of the ungodly. It's like the Virgin Mary, you know, it, her reaction when she's told that she's conceived of the Holy Ghost. But even laying aside the, you know, the, um, the longevity, you know, um, I mean, that, this is just totally, absolutely staggering. I mean, the, the strongest of, of saints, the holiest children of God, we suffer weakness, don't we? You know, there, there are times, you know, where we, we cry out to the Lord, you know, like that man in the New Testament, Lord, I, I believe, help my, help my unbelief. Yeah. Beneath the perfect robe of Christ's righteousness, there remains the tatters of unbelief. Yeah. But our unbelief differs from that of, of the atheist, of the godless. This, this, this laughter of Abraham's is not that. Abraham believed this stupendous declaration. He believed in the resurrection at the last day. That's why, that's why he was, that's why later on he, he, he was willing to sacrifice the child. Not just that he, not just that he believed in this mighty covenant God who brought this grace to him, but he believed he believed that he was able to bring forth a child from his dead loins and from the womb, the dead womb of his wife, Sarah. But isn't this salvation? Believing uh, in the God who raises the dead? Romans 10 verse 9. If thou canst believe in thy heart that God raises the dead. This is a man whose faith will not lie down. You know? The more impossible you make a thing for Abraham, the more he believes. So his laughter, his laughter is not a question, it's not the question of unbelief of atheism. It, it, it's an exclamation of faith, of joy. That God is going to do this thing. And so the promise is reiterated. Verse 18. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, thy wife Abraham, shall bear thee a son. Indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him with Isaac. I mean, it's a rightful plea of a father, isn't it? I mean, Ishmael, you know, um, Ishmael's, um, he, has a, he has a responsibility to him as well, you know? And it's his, his desire that, that, well, that he should be included in the covenant as well, yeah? Even though he's an illegitimate child, he still has a responsibility to him and a spiritual obligation. So he desires that he should live in the fullest sense, as, as with Isaac, that he should live eternally. That he should live before God, in the presence of God. He desires the salvation of the boy. So you see how that Abram didn't just believe in God. Yeah. He believed every word that God spoke. Yeah. Every word that he said to him. And it took precedence over his feelings. Yeah. It took precedence over his fears. It takes precedence over his own preferences. Beloved, that's what true and saving faith is. Yeah. God taking precedence over everything in your life. 
following him, doing what he says. And he's assured, Sarah, Abraham, Sarah shall have this child. Yeah. She will bring forth the son. And his name is to be called Isaac, verse 19. And he and he alone will be the covenant child. And notice with Abraham, there's no arguing. There's no arguing. But provision is to be made for Ishmael, verses 20 through 22. Gently, firmly, graciously, he is reassured. You've been heard with regard to Ishmael. Ishmael is a type of Israel after the flesh. There were many in Israel, were there not? Oh, they were, uh, they were Jews nationally. They belonged to the nation of Israel. They perhaps had been circumcised and... Maybe they attended the temple worship, um, uh, you know, week after week after week, but they were never, they were in the flesh, never been circumcised in heart, never born again, never came to a true knowledge of God. There were many, many such in Israel. And Ishmael is a type of Israel after the flesh. Now, both of them are children of Abraham, yeah. Both of them are children of Abraham and both of them are to receive the sign of the covenant. That's God's commandment, all the males in the house. But one is of grace and the other is of the flesh is carnal. Does not belong to God. Like many, many I say in the nation of Israel. They had circumcision. They had the word of God, they had the prophets, but they did not know God. But within the chosen nation of Israel, there was a promised seed, the seed of Abraham, who through the sovereign operations of God's grace, working out his covenant purposes, saved, reborn, brought to faith, they and they alone were the true spiritual seed of Israel. But the two coexist together in one house. You've got Isaac and you've got Ishmael. In national Israel, you've got the spiritual seed and you've got the flesh. Yeah. One is of grace, the other is of the flesh and carnal but coexisting together in one nation, in one house, under the same yoke, under the same law. And you have it in the church today. You have the same mixture. You've got the carnal and the spiritual. You've got those in churches today, doubtless throughout Birmingham and throughout the country, throughout the world. Many people singing songs of praise to God many of them and there's a mix there are some who truly are the seed of Israel the seed of Abraham who truly are children of God and those who are after the flesh just the same it's never been any different but the covenant is established with Isaac verse 21 but my covenant Will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at the set time in the next year. The distinction is made clear, and it's not um, it's nothing to do with family, it's nothing to do with title, it's nothing to do with profession, it's nothing to do with symbol, whether circumcision or baptism that makes one uh, a true, a real Jew, or believer, if you like. It is simply and only God's purpose in election. So God explicitly rules out Ishmael, and the interview, verse 22, is terminated by God himself. 
Abraham does not persist. Later we learn that Abraham also knows how to stop praying concerning the matter with Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham believed his faith was a reality, but God said to precedence, what was good for God was good for Abraham. I ask you this morning, is what is good for God good for you? Thirdly and finally, the covenant sign applied. Verse 23. Abram took Ishmael his son and all that were in his house and all that were bought with his money. The whole household, every male in the household. The household of Abraham then constituted the church in the Old Testament dispensation. Yeah. This is not unnecessary repetition. This is very, very important for us. In the early part, it dealt with the institution, the giving, the commanding of the sign, and now comes the appropriation, now comes the application of the sign in the Old Testament. Notice, will you, first of all, that you're never too old. Yeah? As I say, not an unneeded repetition. When we read that Abraham did what God said, notice, will you please, that he did it exactly the same day. Verse, uh, the end of verse uh, 23, in the self same day as God had said unto him. There was none of this, um, well, I need to pray about this. I need to think about this. I need to bring this before the Lord. God had spoken. God had told Abraham what to do. And he did it that day. Obedience. Um, not just a, this is not just an unattractive word of medical detail. The emphasis is not on the physical. The emphasis here is about the practical obedience of faith. Abraham's doing. He's 90 Think about it. He's 99 years of age. Yeah? I'm now pushing 78. Yeah? How many people do you think in the church today you would get the excuse? Maybe my age or maybe a little bit older. Who would bring before you every excuse under the sun for not obeying God in some principle, in some matter concerning their faith. 99 years old, and he doesn't even bat an eyelid. Today it will be done. Yeah. So the appearance of the Lord is now over. The Lord appeared to him. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful experience, but it's now a past experience, okay? But now comes the test of the authenticity of that experience, of all our experiences. I hear people telling me about wonderful experiences that they've had at the hands of the Lord. Wonderful things, exquisite but they don't walk in obedience to God. Yeah. They don't do his will. They're not walking in the covenant way. They're not walking in obedience to, 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 to the Lord. What is the proof? If a person says to you, or if you claim yourself to have had some wonderful, marvelous experience at the hands of God, what is the test of the authenticity of it? Does it lead to obedience? Yeah. That's the touchstone. If it doesn't, 
doesn't mean a thing. Just, uh, forget how wonderful it was. It doesn't mean a thing. The covenant of grace, you see, the result of it, it's a covenant, you know, that God establishes with us his people. Yeah? I will be... I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be a father to you and you will be my children. And I will bless you and I will forgive you. I will justify you unto all eternity. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You are so wonderful. You're my children and, and, and I love you. And I won't let you walk in sin. What kind of response do you think that brings out of a person's heart but grateful obedience? My feet hit the floor in the morning and before they've hit the floor, my thought is, what am I going to do to glorify my covenant God today? Yeah. Not what am I going to wear, what am I going to feed my belly with? What am I going to do for him? My covenant God, grace, undeserved favor. Faithful obedience. Abraham's faith was more than just asset, lip service to God. He wasn't just a hearer of God's word. Some people maybe say, well, you know, I, 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 I often hear, I often hear God's word, you know, but I'm old now, you know, I'm 78 years of age, you know, I like that some kind of excuse. You're only too old when you're dead, yeah, to obey God in me. Abram's 99, and there's only one thing in his mind. 99 years of age, there's only one thing in his mind, to do what God tells him to do. Yeah. You know, uh, you, 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 you'll, you'll have heard of, I'm sure you'll have heard of David Wilkerson. He's, he's gone now, like, but he was in New York City for a while. I think I'm telling, I think I'm telling this story, like, of this, this, um, woman in his congregation. She'd been a missionary out in the mission field for many years. I don't know where it was, somewhere in the, in the Far East. And she'd come home and she had, um, well, that's the word that's not in the Bible, but she had retired, you know. And she had a grandson. And um, when she came home from the mission field and, and retired, she became what we call today in, in modern uh, parlance, she became a couch potato. Yeah. She sat all day on the couch feeding herself, stuffing herself, and with the, the television thing in her hand, you know, from channel to channel to channel. Yeah. And her grandson came to visit her one day and he said, Grandma, he said, um, he says, you know, he said, he said, when you were out in the mission field, you used to send stuff back to us. And you used to come back and tell us things, you know, wonderful things that God was doing and, and you were doing for him. He says, I'll look at you now. I don't want to know your God. I don't want to know your God. 99 years of age. Not too old. There's no demobilization from God's army. The word retirement's not in the Bible. 65 might be the year of retirement in state law, but that's not in biblical. You're never too old to obey God, and you're never too old to do what he tells you to do, and you're never too old to have the sign of the covenant applied to you commandment of God. Never too old. And it wasn't too late for the children either. And it wasn't too old for um, well for Abraham himself either. 99 years of age. 
Ishmael, he's 13 years of age, so it's not too old for him. He may have lost some time, but lost time can be corrected by the grace of God, can it not? We don't, we certainly, uh, in this matter, we certainly don't agree with um, the Roman Catholic um, practice of, or even the Baptist practice of, of rebaptism, reapplying of the covenant sign. Practiced, of course, by other sects and cults too. The JWs, um, that's not Trinitarian baptism, so therefore that's not a correct, a proper biblical application of the covenant sign. It's the children of believing parents. Again, this, this misses the practice of the Church of England, the Church of Scotland. Anybody can come and have their kids done. Yeah. You pay the man some money and you get your kid done. That's not the biblical uh, mandate and that's not the biblical practice. It is the children of believing parents or parent, yeah? And the parent themselves, of course, to be baptized. It's not just the case of wearing a label, but the abuse of it, and there is abuse of it. Many people abuse the Bible, but we don't throw the Bible away, do we? Just because the sign, or the, the sacramental sign is abused, doesn't negate the thing. The thing is to be done is kept conducted properly. It's a solemn commitment and there's an obligation behind it. So when we have our children, in New Testament parlance, when we have our children baptized, then it's a commitment, it's an obligation on our part to teach our children to walk in the way of the covenant. But we know, we understand. We do it with the understanding. We grasp it, we get it. Circumcision, baptism, the sign does not save. It's only a sign. It's only a symbol. It doesn't save. So when people throw the argument at me, your children have been baptized but they're not saved, so what? Neither, neither teaching them, neither catechizing them will save them. You can teach them till the cows come home. That won't save them. It's only God that can do that. That's God's doing. So the children are not too young and they're not too old either. Uh, you know, if, if it's done late, okay, it's done late, yeah. You bury the past and you press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You, you, you look to the future, we, we correct, yeah. But here in this household, verse 27, nobody escaped. None of the males, I mean, all the males. And this constituted the church back then, yeah? All the males were marked with the sign of the covenant. They were, in other words, they were claimed for God and they were marked for his service. Saved to serve. And as belonging together, yeah? As belonging together. This is symbolized in it too. We are God's people. We are God's covenant people. We and our children. He has pledged himself yeah, to be ours and our children's. And this is our privilege, covenant privilege. But again it brings responsibility too. To live worthy as those who bear God's name. And so we teach our children along the way. No, no, you don't 
taught like that in this home. This is a covenant home. Yeah? You don't talk, child, like you hear the other children talking at school. Yeah? This is a covenant home. We belong to God. You belong to God. And you have a responsibility to God to behave yourself, to conduct yourself in a manner fitting. No, boy, you will not talk to me, your father, in that way, because I am your father. As God is your father, and you are a child of the covenant, and you will not talk that way in this covenant home. But it doesn't eliminate the need for faith. The application of the sign of the covenant does not automatically create faith. There's no saving power in the sign and the sacrament. Only a sign. Only a symbol. So in spite of the privileges, benefits, belonging to the covenant people of God, People can and they do contract out in unbelief. They fall away. And I tell you, fall away. Fall is the right word. It's not walk away. They fall from a great height when they do so. An enormous height. Um, Hebrews 6, verse 5 and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall, fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That's what they do when they walk away from the covenant family and the covenant community of God. They crucify the Son of God again and put him to open shame. It's a denial of God. It's a denial of his grace. It happens. It's a sad reality. A very sad reality. But for the rest of us, it's an act of obedience. An act of obedience that we take by faith. Why do I have the sign of the covenant applied to my children? Because God commands me to. That's why. It's a commandment. Just the same as, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's a commandment just the same. Yeah? Here in Abraham's household, this action would in incapacitate all the males in the encampment. And so they would be left without any human protection whatsoever. That would take faith, wouldn't it? Huh? Or they would, I, don't, I don't doubt for a moment there would be many questions in that household that day. Maybe protests from male and female alike. But Abraham was a man who ruled his house. And now Sarah, as she's called, is a princess. So there's no quarreling. She does what she's told. God said, and we do, says Abraham. So it's all the working of verse 1, you see. Walk before thee, walk before me, and be thou perfect. Complete, that is. Completely mine completely dedicated to me and to my covenant of grace. Yeah. Holy discipline. Oh, we balk at many, many things that God commands. That's not possible. I can't do that. My family won't allow that. What God enjoins, God makes possible. God commands us to preach the gospel, doesn't he? Is that impossible? 
in all the world? Is that impossible? The obstinacy of men, the resistance of Satan, whatever, whatever, it behoves us, beloved in Christ, to do what God commands, not to yield to the impediments. Just do what he says. Because we do not labor in vain. As I said to you last Sunday morning, to be happy, to enjoy the blessings of God, is to walk in obedience to them. But as long as we are walking in disobedience, we will, if you're a child of God, you will never be happy. You will never be happy. So we do what he says. Because he has established with us a covenant of grace. It's inviolable, it's unbreakable, it's unilateral. That means, that means that it's all God's doing. Yeah? He does it. He establishes it and he brings it to a conclusion. He even keeps it because we can't. We're sinful. And so, out of gratitude, thankfulness to this great, mighty, triune God who has condescended to come down to thee and my house, to his people. Huh? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. I will be your God and you will be my people, and I will bless you, and I will love you unto all eternity. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. This afternoon, God willing, we'll look at the New Testament, what it says about the sign of the cross. Amen. Yeah.